Cool, right then. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, Good. Um, hi, I'm Matt. So, welcome to our session on blinding research. Uh, we've got quite a bit to go through. Validity, reliability, generalizability, bias, and family practice. Um, essentially, I've created some exercises that needs to be there, unfortunately. <laughs> to help us demonstrate the principles. Uh, once again, this is a nice open environment. Everybody can ask a question. Everybody can say anything if they've got a point they would like to make. Uh, so we're going to use Frank, these pictures of Frank uh, up here on the board. We're also going to use one of our former colleagues, James Pratt. This is him having run the Great North Run. He did it in one hour, 39 minutes, which he tells me is a very, very good time. So between James and between Frank, we're going to have a discussion about some uh, definitions and some principles. Right then, first up, we are going to play a game of Dot Frank's Nose. So what, we, what I'd like is six volunteers to come up and be blindfolded and try and put two dots, one at a time, on Frank's nose. Okay. Everybody volunteer around. Okay. Alex, good! Okay. So here's a point of what accuracy is. Accuracy means that that's close close to the true value. Yeah. So just like when James Pratt was running and he got his value of 1 hour 39 minutes, an accurate result is a result which closely reflects the true value. So in which case an accurate dot is be close to Frank's nose. Okay. Like an accurate arrow hits the bullseye. Precise data doesn't necessarily have to be accurate, it's just near each other. You haven't got a large range. So actually, up here, they're quite close together. Lucy, you've managed to be quite accurate and also quite precise because you're quite near each other. Whereas over here, we're not really very accurate and we're not particularly precise either because you've got a wide range. So, if James Pratt was to run the race again and again and again and again, precise data would be close together. He'd get 1 hour 39 again, 1 hour 38, 1 hour 40, close together. So accuracy and precision describes data. Okay. Does that make sense? So you don't have to be accurate to be precise, you don't have to be precise to be accurate. It describes the data. Good. Marvellous. So that's well done. Well done, Lucy. I think you win that. Yeah. What I would like you to do is, you've got a couple of minutes. I would like you to draw Frank. So underneath here, I would like you to draw him. We need to get photos of this. Okay, try and be as accurate as possible. We don't want cartoons. I want a okay. nice... Do you want cartoons? I don't want a cartoon version of Frank. I want you to replicate that below there. Oh, oh dear. You know? Oh, what do you think, guys? Wow. Like <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there we go. I forgot the name. I don't know last time. on full the rest it is a little bit like the nasal cavities collapse, <laughs> and that is a little bit eyes. scary. That one. <laughs> yeah. So let's say we are judging these pictures of Frank, and we are going to award a prize for the best picture of Frank. Okay. We want to be reliable judges. <laughs> Reliability describes a test. So while accuracy and precision describe data, reliability describes our test. And essentially we want it that if a test is reliable, it will give consistent results for the same thing. So if we were judging these two beautiful pictures of Frank, how are we going to be reliable judges and make sure that we are judging them to the same standard? You just have to have a criteria what you say. Oh, yep. Okay. okay. <clears throat> what else? Time. Yeah. Any non-biased approach. Non-biased approach. Good. Coming on to bias in a bit. Good. 
Absolutely. Okay. So, say this was being judged by one judge who likes clowns, and this one was being judged by somebody who hates the colour red. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. No. So that's what we call inter-rater reliability. The reliability between two raters. Okay. So say you've got somebody in one site who thinks that there's a certain criteria versus another one who's a bit who's got a different criteria. That's what we call inter-rater reliability. Cool. If Alex was to produce this exact same picture again, should she get the same mark again? Yes. 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 And that's what we call test, retest reliability. So if you do the same thing again, if James Pratt ran the exact same race again, you should get the exact same time again. If you do the same work again, you should get the same uh, result again. Has anyone here ever done a day's worth of marking for an OSCE or anything like that? Had to go off and do a day's worth yes. of marking or anything? What's it like, guys? Um, they get marginally better than shit. Hey, did that get out? <laughs> <laughs> Good. What's it like being the examiner during a day? You've got a day of oh, right. tired towards the end. Absolutely. And so, does you? And what does that do to I you? I would say you, you, your marking probably uh, was not as good as when you first yeah. started. Absolutely. So, say this is being judged by a panel in the morning who are nice and happy. They've just had their coffee. They're raring to go, and it's really exciting. And they give yeah. this a five out of five. And then by the end of the day, their coffee's worn off. They hate life, and they give this a one out of five just to get the whole thing over. So that's an intra rater reliability. Look, the actual, you only got one rater, but it's how that might vary during the time. Okay. And this is one of the big reasons why medical finals have changed, because it used to be across many different sites with different examiners, and there's too much unreliability. Because examiners at different sites, some are more old school, some wanted to do it a different way, some had certain patients, some had other patients, and so there's too much unreliability which is why now all the exams are held in one place and they're trying to earn the same day as much as possible. So accuracy and precision describe the data, reliability describes the test. <coughs> Internal validity, do you know what that means? Has anyone heard that expression before? It was in film. When we talk about the internal validity of a study, it just needs to be with how it would be comparable compared to other studies in regards to the outcomes it gives. Not quite, no. Is it about how it's been carried out, as in how strictly high? Um, yeah. Stick to rules, and I actually chosen the most accurate patients, and blah blah. Yeah. So internal validity essentially describes how much does this test result accurately reflect what is actually being found. So that if James Pratt comes fifth out of the runners, an internally valid, if there's high internal validity, it means that he was the fifth highest. That is the accurate representation of how he did. Does that mean he's the fifth fastest runner in the world? No, no just no. that particular way. And that's where external validity comes into it, and this is what we also call generalizability. So this is when you guys, when you're off in Prague or wherever, and you see a study that's been performed in, say, Azerbaijan, the generalizability of that is, how much can I actually take from that and put into my own setting? Okay. So, a high validity, be one that accurately represents what's actually going on in that site. External validity represents how much can that be extrapolated and used in other sites. Do you think they can be both high internal validity and high external validity? So this is something that's difficult because when we do studies here, we're a major trauma centre with a 24-hour radiologist, 24-hour major trauma unit. So that when we do trials, we can show high internal validity, but your DGH that's listening to us might not be able to go, well, that doesn't, not going to work at our site, so there's not so much high internal validity. So there is a balancing act to be done. And the way you can go about doing that is to have a randomized trial that's being well performed, 
but also to have as loose criteria as possible. And that's how you can try and create as high internability as possible and high externality. But it is a balance. Does that make sense? The difference between these numbers? Cool. So, bias. What is bias? Oops, walk into that. <laughs> What does bias mean? To favour something. Yeah. Or, like, or not, or conversely not to favour. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So bias is anything that skews your results. It can be one way or the other. You can be biased against a certain type of person, you can be biased against a certain anything really. A certain football team, you can be biased against a certain politician, etc. etc. And you can have bias in your research, and that is anything that skews your data one way or the other. And you can have bias at all the stages during design, during performance, and during the life cycle. Okay. So what we're going to do is now, but another exercise, I've got to get you into some groups, I don't know, pairs. Uh, she wants to take one, pass them along. Yeah. What we've got is, these are some scenarios, and these are some definitions of different types of bias. And what I'd like you to do is over the next five, ten minutes, is just work through... Do you, do you one each pair? One, uh, one per pair. One per pair. Might as well, then? We need to have a pair. Oh, you've got... So you might find that there's more than one bias for some of them, but there is one that fits best for each particular one, so all the biases should be used up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
sort of American exit policy in the, in the 40s elections where they voted for the Republican candidates. They all voted for the Republican candidates. The Democrat actually won by a landslide. But you also get the shy Republicans and the shy Tories, don't they? You go up to somebody in the street and go, How are you going to vote? People say Labour, but it makes you sound nice and calm. And then you go to the booth and you vote because you want to follow them tomorrow. So by the process of elimination, if it's wrong left, you can go back. Cool. Alex and Matt. Sorted. Kind of. We're still pondering, but we can stop. <laughs> they're on number two. They are. They're on the, they're in a big chat. <laughs> Cool. Right then, so uh, you're interviewing patients about sweet consumption and developing diabetes. You want to know who has diabetes and who doesn't before the interview so you can probe more about risk factors if they've got diabetes. What have you got? Interview bias. Interview bias. Interviewer. Yeah. So I wrote this with interviewer bias in mind. Okay. Uh, the interviewer may know that the outcome and change the question based on this. Okay. So say you were doing this study. If you know that somebody coming in doesn't have diabetes, you can treat them differently to somebody who does have it coming in. So there's a clear sort of conflict there, and that can be the um, bias in the interviewer. Cool. You recruit only young, healthy patients to the intervention arm and you put older, frailer patients onto the placebo. What have we got? Yeah. So it's slightly more channeling, but there is selection in there as well. Okay. So the reason. Is it one, two, three, four, five, all the way down to eleven? Is it chronological in order? Sorry. Did they match? Don't know. I hope not. Because there's three and four on three and four. Oh God, maybe. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> this is going to become very easy, then, isn't it? Okay. Cool. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so yeah, so you are using slightly different criteria to go on different arms, but the reason I put this as channeling is, imagine if you were trying to show that your intervention works, you're pushing those who are going to be, have better outcomes anyway onto your intervention arm, whereas those who are going to have worse outcomes because they're older, frail, or poorly, are going to go on to the other one. So that's an important thing to look at in any study, to go, what were the criteria, how did you get into the different cohorts, and um, this is why we randomised to completely rule, rule this one, this uh, particular bias out. You want to start a study looking at surgical outcomes. You will ask surgeons if they are pleased with the outcome of their procedures. <laughs> Is it flawed study design? Flawed study design. That's the first one. That's the first question. No, so I'm going to <laughs> Damn. <laughs> You see, I've, got, I've, I've flawed this one. <laughs> Brilliant, yes. Flawed study design. What's wrong with, why is this a flawed study design then? Why is it wrong? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You've done this piece of work. You uh, did this operation. Are you happy with how it's gone, Mr. Yes. You know, Are you happy with how this has gone? Are you happy with your work? Everybody's going to say yes, it's completely flawed study design. People will tear your study apart when you go, we found that all of our surgeons are really happy with their work, we do good surgery. You go, no, that's a flawed study design. That's called cool, the NHS, that's how we are actually operating. Right it is, isn't it, unfortunately. It's a long way study. Cool. You find that coffee drinkers have an increased risk of heart disease? We're not, we're it's confounding. Yeah. Just by your list of married numbers. Okay, so this has gone horribly wrong. <laughs> How is this a confounding factor then? How is it confounding? Because the order of the statements. I mean, yeah, ignore that. 
<laughs> Ignore that brother, how is it confounding? What do coffee drinkers also do? Smoke. There we go. So. I don't. What's that? I don't. I don't. You have to tell us, dude. Okay. So this is why, people, you know, studies will find that back in the day, people who went to the pub a lot got lung cancer. They go to a, even if you're not a smoke, you go to the pub for a drink, you got lung cancer. Therefore, pubs cause lung cancer. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, or yeah. drinking pints causes lung cancer. So you know, that's a confounding factor. Something that's a third association that you don't think of that actually gives you a false association. So in this case, it would be that the coffee drinkers you ask like to have a cigarette with their coffee, therefore they're at increased risk of heart disease. Having looked at the coffee I drink, I hope that's not a true association. Cool, so this one's going to be easy then, isn't it? Next one, you're investigating lung cancer to see if there's a link between drinking coffee, looking back at how much coffee they drank before the diagnosis. Selection Well done. <laughs> it's not in order. I don't know. It is. Why is that selection bias? Why is it selection bias? Hmm. Oh, it's recall bias. So selection bias is very... So retrospective studies where you know an outcome are very open to this. Because you can go, I know you have lung cancer, I'm therefore going to look back at anything you did beforehand and try and root out an association. So this is written for that as a selection bias way. And it's something that's very, very dangerous in that we can go, oh, you know, you had X exposure, I'm going to look back, therefore, you've had X outcome, I'm going to look back for any exposure to try and find it. Cool. You compare the success rate of different surgeons, you notice the more experienced surgeons have the best results. It's really easy, isn't it? Sorry, sorry about this. <laughs> okay. How is this performance bias? Based on practitioner studies, which are some of How is it performance bias, guys? The more experienced you are, the better you're going to be. Yeah, absolutely. So you go to better grades. Absolutely. So that can be we've got more experienced surgeons, that can be, this is a particular piece of equipment that we always use and we find that we're better at using this piece of equipment than another place that's only just Scott has, has um, taken on. Um, you know, so this is uh, something that surgical studies are particularly open to, is this performance bias aspect of it. And the other thing you find out with surgeons is each one will have a particular way of doing it and they'll all be really good at that one particular way of doing it, whether it's laparoscopic, whether it's open, or however they do it. Okay, so performance bias comes into that. This is going to be very easy. We now have 25% placebo patients, lost to follow up. Well done. <laughs> Transfer bias. <laughs> so it should alarm you if you're looking at a study and you find there's a huge difference between which cohorts and the amount of people who are lost to follow up because it shows that however they were doing it was not fair across the board and that there's something that's going on so that they meant that people were lost to follow up. So it should alarm you if there is this big difference between which arm of the study. They should always be very similar. They should show how many were lost to follow up and they should be similar. Is that because there would be potentially a incentive to stay yeah. if you've got the intervention? Yeah. So we didn't care about these placebo patients. We just logged on to notice to check that they were still alive. That was it, fine, moving on. Whereas this one said, we bow, you know, we rang them up every other week to make sure they were still okay. We asked them X, Y, and Z, all of this. So if you see this sort of thing, you're like, well, your study was bad. Well, cool. this is it, unless you can blind this. Yeah, this is it. This is, again, why are we blind? Because if I know that you've just had some sugar water rather than my brand new drug, I don't care about you. And it doesn't matter. I only care about the people I know I've got that, which is why we're blind. Who's this about? And Wakefield. Well done. So you're a fame hungry alarmist. You ask patients of children with autism to link it to the time they had their vaccination. And now we all get pizzas. Absolutely. What type of bias is this? Recall. Recall bias. Yeah, brilliant. So essentially, Andrew Wakefield went up to some parents, 12 of them, 12 parents, 
a very big cohort and ask them, your kid has digestive problems and or autism, what time did they start to have it? Was it around the same time they had their, their MMR? And the parents went, mm, yeah, I think so. And that was enough for him to write a paper causing the trouble that we have now. Scary, that. And he's now in prison. No, sorry, he's in America, dating El McPherson, touring, uh, touring America with the Make America Great Brigade. And what follows him as he goes across America? Donald Trump. Measles. Measles. <laughs> There's a link. Wherever he goes, measles follows him. And New York is currently in the midst of, a, of an epidemic, thanks to him. Yeah, definitely the reason all unvaccinated people from going into public areas. Mm. Like, labourers and if you're, under, yeah, if you're under 18 and you're not vaccinated, you can't go into a public area in America. How do you police In New York at the moment. Well, it's yeah. American Cool. You're investigating a new intervention, and as your comparison, you go back and you use 20 year old guidelines. Brilliant. Yeah. Good. So, if you find out that your new intervention is absolutely brilliant, but you're actually comparing it to something that was used in the 1980s, 1990s, that is not a fair study. You know, you should be comparing it against the most up-to-date guidelines. That's fair. Cool. Your trial finds the intervention doesn't have a significant effect, and your sponsor therefore says don't, don't publish. Is it is worth pointing out um, that a lot of these have got many names? Yeah. Just if you read the journal, you'll see, instead of citation marks, you'll see publication marks. Yeah, absolutely. So just be aware, there's yeah. like 70 names of bias, and there's only about five or six real types of bias in it. Yeah. So you're not and each time you Google, there's a new name that's going to be something, absolutely. So attrition citation, bias. publish, uh, attrition bias, yeah. Um, people publish positive results much better than they publish negative results, it's a well known fact. So this would be a citation or publication bias as that result. So that's that. Uh, <coughs> you want to investigate the rates of PDVT. You will record all patients who report chest or calf pain following surgery. A misclassification. Why is this a misclassification? Because not everybody reports chest or calf pain or PDVT. Absolutely. Are you actually? So if you were looking at this study being presented and you found out that we were checking our PE rates following surgery, so how we did that was asking everybody, do you have chest pain or calf pain following the surgery? Does that mean that each one of them had a PE or a yeah. DVT? No. What would have been better? You actually ultrasounding, scanning, doing, you know, finding out the patient, doing diagnostic testing, actually finding out that they've got a confirmed PE or DVT. So this is misclassification. So you'd be able to look at this study and go, no, that's wrong. Cool. Thank you guys. Well done, that got better as you went on, didn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> never mind. Uh, next one, we're going to be looking at writing a paper. So that'll be interesting. Uh, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you for our artists. And a take home message um, be accurate and precise, appreciate bias, don't be a prat. <laughs> oh, God. Thank you very much. Thanks. <coughs> Boom, and have ten minutes to spare. There we go. Thanks. 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 Govan, don't steal my pen. <laughs>